Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Yep. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and get your Bibles open. Hallelujah. We're talking about having a developing spiritual sensitivity. Now, look, if you haven't been with us on Wednesday, I'm telling you, Wednesday night was an awesome service. If you missed it, you missed a good one. I'm telling you, we got in some good stuff on righteousness and, you know, out of the book of Romans, praise God. And so we encourage you to be here with us on our Wednesday night services. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're talking about developing spiritual sensitivity, talking about the need for that, uh, how, you know, the day, in the last days perilous times will come. We've got to be spiritually sensitive. Let me say this. There's two sides to the need of spiritual sensitivity. One is to be able to judge and watch out for false leaders, false doctrines, false spirits, false things going on. And then on the other side is to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost so we can walk with him. Amen. Amen. So we need to be able to judge what's right and wrong. Then we need to be able to judge uh, or, or adhere to and hear the voice of the Spirit and go with him. Amen. Can you say amen? All right. I said, can you say amen? How about say amen? amen. Thank you. All right. Hallelujah. We are the, we are the first church of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't know if we're the first church, but we're one of the churches. Hallelujah. And so we read from Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, the whole chapter. We, we've made several points here. We're talking about uh, how that Samuel uh, learned to, to hear the voice or to understand the voice of God. We're giving certain points. The first point was uh, that we minister unto the Lord. That means to wait on the Lord or to serve the Lord. It can mean worshiping the Lord, but it's not limited to that. Oftentimes in the church, we limit ministering to the Lord, to prayer and seeking the face of God. But, you know, it also entails just going out and serving the Lord. Amen. You know, there'll be times God will talk to you when you're cleaning the toilets for the church that he didn't talk to you when you were in prayer. Yeah. Why? Because God wants you to serve him too. Amen. God wants you to do his will. Amen. Uh, you, you just, you know, you can't limit God to, you know, well, if I pray 10 hours in the Holy Ghost in my closet, and I'm not demeaning that, we need to pray in the Spirit. Paul prayed in the Spirit. The church is to be filled with the Spirit and pray in the Spirit. That's, that is a necessity in the church, but we need to serve and do the will of God also. Amen. We need to be at busy about doing his will. Remember when Jesus went, lets his parents, left him back, well, he, he stayed behind in Jerusalem, and they were three days out, and by the time they got back to him, they kind of rebuked him for, for startling them and, and upsetting them and leaving them alone. He said, and he was in there arguing with the, the doctors and, and the Pharisees and Sadducees about the scriptures, I say arguing, de debating or discussing. And, and they said, why did you do this? He said, did you not know it must be about my father's business? I believe every Christian must be about the father's business. I said, every Christian should be about the father's business. So ministering to the Lord is, is also, is praying, it's seeking the face of God, and it also includes uh, being about the Father's business. Amen. Well, what's the Father's business? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. And Jesus goes on and says, you know, all the different things. Listen, folks, the number one thing that the church should be doing is not looking for a pulpit ministry, not looking to write a book, not looking to be the latest, greatest television host. It should be going into the highways and the byways and compelling them to come into the kingdom of God. And if God wants to promote you to the television, promote you into a book, fine. But stop trying to figure out how to promote yourself and make yourself big and go do what the Father said do. That was a really, really, really good place to give one of those hearty amens. Amen. So you should be busy about going about doing what the Father wants you to do. Amen. 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 See, too many people sitting around waiting for their ministry, waiting for the, you know, the, the, the pie in the sky, waiting for somebody to call them up and come preach at the, church, the convention of 20,000 people, you know, and to get their books printed and to be marketed and to look slick and to look cool, but they're not busy about doing what the Father said go do. We've got to be serving the Lord. We've got to be about the Father's business. Amen. And if we'll get busy as a church about the Father's business, we'll fill this building before we can turn around. Come on now. If we get busy about the Father's business, compelling people and telling people and sharing with people, and not just kind of sitting back and being, you know, little church mice, but get busy about the Father's business, glory to God, we'll fill it up. <coughs> and we'll have to move. Not because we can't afford it, because we don't have enough room. 
about, lost about 45% of you on that one. Let's pick it back up. Let's get it back up to 100%. Amen. Amen. So we minister unto the Lord. Second, and we, we kind of got in this, didn't really finish it. We're going to try to finish it today so we can move on. Listen to those who are older than you and know God's voice. Remember, Samuel kept running into Eli saying, you called me. He said, I didn't call you, boy. I'll say, I'll say something. You'll bother me. We'll go back to bed. Amen. Five corner, leg corner. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Dumb kid. I said, boy, I said, boy, you're bothering me, boy. All right. And after about the third time, Eli, even in his stupor of fleshly carnality, said, proceed, it was the Lord. I'm telling you, you can learn from those older than you. Just because they're not walking on water and floating through clouds doesn't mean you can't learn from them. Amen. And just because you just graduated from Bible school and you think you know everything there is to know about the Bible, Jesus, the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Trinity and the seven spirits of God, you, you know, you can learn from those older than you. Amen. amen. I said amen. And just because you had a, a series of goosebumps going down your spine and you, you know, and you had a miracle happen, you can still learn from those older than you. In the little says, I'm older. Learn from her. All right. I said, Amen. I remember Dad Hagen talking about Brother Summerall. Was at Raymond, he was ministering. He said, he said, I was, he said, he said something last week that I've been praying for the, about the answer for for 15 years. Now they were contemporaries. See, a lot of times we think we know everything. You know, when you get, and your Brother Hagen at that time, this was 1981, so I guess Dad Hagen, you know, was old 60 something, 65, 64, something like that. He's still learning. Been praying for 15 years about an answer. And Brother Summerall comes in and, and says something during the service, and God gives him the answer. We can learn from those uh, others in the Lord, older, especially those older than us in the Lord. We don't get to the point we can't learn. Amen. Now, listen, listen, you know, I, listen, you can, I can't go the other way. You know, you can learn things from young people who, are, who have got a lot of zeal and stuff. But listen, you young people really need to not just throw the ba baby out the bathwater. I, I heard uh, Brother Summer, we were sitting in a, uh, um, I can't remember. I, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was a, um, it was a dinner set. And uh, I, got, I got to sit with him at dinner twice. One was out in uh, uh, Temecula, California at, at Ed Dufresne's church when they did the first Fresh Oil Conference out there with Mark Bazee, uh, Ed Dufresne, and um, uh, Brother Summerall. We went out to that, that conference back in 1991 or whatever. I don't know. That. Nathan was a little guy. He was, it was, it was after 93. He was, he was a little bitty guy. He was like two. So it was like 95. And uh, we got to go back and eat with Brother Summerall. And, I mean, not Brother Summerall. Brother Dufresne. And, um, and uh, Brother Summerall. That's right, Brother Summerall. And he, he got to talking about, about his brother. His brother had retired from the Assemblies of God. After, oh, 50 years as, as a minister in the Assemblies of God. And he was mad. But, now, listen, there's the only thing you brought Brother Summerall. You didn't warn you about his emotions. Okay, he was pretty clear where he was. He said, he's sitting up in his house, and not one single one of those young ministers in that conference come and sit at his feet. He was ticked off. Why? Where, do you, where did he let, think he learned some of the things he learned, the boldness that he got? You know what he did? He went and sat at, some, uh, at uh, Wigglesworth's feet. He learned, he went and sat at Brother Wigglesworth's feet in England before the war and was sitting, he would just talk, they would pray together. He would show up, showed up the second day, he showed up, had a news, the first day he showed up at his house, had a newspaper under his arm, he opened the door, said, man, young man, you can come in, but that thing stays outside. So there's nothing wrong with reading the newspaper, yeah, but how many people have you raised from the dead? Can't argue with success, 26, they, they recorded in his ministry. Three he writes about in his books, but another person did a, bi a biography of him who traveled with him and knew him. He, said he counted 26 people he raised from the dead. Now, I, if, you can, if you can raise the dead without reading the newspaper, let's go ahead and start reading newspapers. Amen. Amen. I said, Brother Summerall sat at his feet. He, as a young minister, he sat at his feet and had the hands laid on him. He says, you know, and, and he, Brother Summerall said he was not bold until Wigglesworth laid hands on him. He laid hands on him right before he left to come back to America because all the Americas were being uh, ordered out of England because of the war. You know, we weren't in it yet. England was, getting, uh, was, was declaring war on Germany, Germany on England, and all the Americas were, were ordered to, evac to, to leave. And so he went and sat with Brother Wigglesworth for the last time, and Wigglesworth, I mean, Wiggles, Summerall went to Wigglesworth, and Wigglesworth laid hands on him and, and declared the boldness of his life on Brother Summerall. And it came. 
<laughs> is anyone, under the term, definition, or description, bull in a china shop mean anything to you? He's a bull in the devil's china shop. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But I remember sitting with him and him talking about how his brother had, had retired after almost 50 years as a pastor in a certain uh, conference down in, in, in the south in, uh, in the Assemblies of God, and no young minister would come sit at his feet. They knew everything. You know, I've been to Bible school. I know everything. There are things you're not going to learn. Thank God for our Bible schools. Thank God for the anointed teachers in our Bible schools. Thank God they're there to help us. There are things you're not going to learn in the classroom. There are things you're going to learn sitting at other ministers' feet. There are things you're going to learn sitting under anointed people who've paved the path and gone the way. Amen? So we need to listen to those older than us in the Lord. You might think you have the, you, you, you might think you got everything, you know, the world by the tail, but what you really have sometimes is a tiger. You better not let go either. You remember that, remember the uh, jungle book? Let go, Baloo. I can't. There's teeth in the other end. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. We read, we read a couple of verses here, remember? Uh, and so he went back and Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they, that, for they watch for your souls that they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that's unprofitable to you. 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all you that are to be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Oh, my. There's a lot of people who misinterpret bold, uh, uh, boldness. And it's really arrogance. They're not humble. Boldness is a, is a strong confidence in the things of God's promise and said and will do. Arrogance is you think you're just better than everybody else. You think you're cool. You, think nobody, you don't need anybody else. Amen. Boldness works with humility. Arrogance works with pride. And we know what happens to the prideful. For God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. I read a guy, Dunnick, a friend of mine, a couple weeks ago, put, well, about a week ago, put on that on his Facebook. He said, God is as actively uh, resisting the proud as he is giving grace to the humble. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He, he's working equal time on both. Hello? See, we get people who want to preach just one side that go, oh, God's giving everybody grace. Yeah, but he's resisting the proud. What's right? We got to remain humble. We got to listen to those older than us in the Lord. Um, 1 Samuel 8 19, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, Nay, we will have a king over us. Now, let me how'd that work out for him? You go back and study Israel after the time that they began to have a king. And they got Saul as their first king. They wanted to have a king like all the other nations. And when they went out to war, they could parade a king. But God wanted to be their king. Amen? And he did everything he could to get them to listen. They wouldn't listen. See, if they had listened, they wouldn't have the trouble they had. Because why? Because you'd have a good king, everything would be good. You'd have a bad king, everything would go bad. You'd have a midway king, everything would be midway. Listening to me out there? Amen. Now, remember when Saul went to battle and he came back and he was told to kill everything. Samuel shows up and Saul runs out. Oh, man, I did it all. I did everything you told me to do. He said, really? What is that bleeding in my ears? Not bleeding, bleating. Sheep bleeding. Making that noise. And so Samuel says, Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, and didst fly upon the spool, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and gone the way which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. That's not what he was told. He was told to kill the king, told to kill the animals, told to kill all, to, to, to wipe it all out. Brought the king back. Why? Probably hoping he had some hidden treasure he's, he's going to get out of him, coerced to get out of him. Let the people have the spoil. That's not what God said to do. See, you, you, well, I think there's a new way of doing stuff. No, there's always, let me tell you the new way of doing stuff. It's God's way. It's the same old way. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a little leeway here. Sometimes people say, you know, we got we to change our methods to reach our generation. And, and I understand that within a certain parameter of context. So I don't want to just, you know, nah, we're not doing anything. We're, we're going to keep our old liturgical look. We're not going to do We're not going to change this. We're going to have columns until Jesus comes back. That's just, I'm not saying that. 
But we got to make sure of one thing. Never will a column save anybody. Never will the lack of a column save anybody. If we do not stay within the parameters of the anointing of God and preach the uncompromised word of God. You know, it doesn't matter what we change or don't change. If we can keep this up here forever until Jesus comes back and have that scripture up there, and it's, oh, praise God, that scripture moves me every time I see it. But if we don't have the anointing, we're not going to get anywhere. We can change it all and put some cool stuff. My son wants to do some cool stuff, you know, and some you know, modern stuff. I'm all right with that. I'm not against that. But I'm telling you, that's not going to save anybody. Do not put any confidence in anything external. It's okay to change. It's okay to do it. But, you know, like, like I said, you know, we, 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 we got to change our methods to reach our generation. Let's make sure that we're not beginning to shift our focus on the power of the method. Because the, power, the, the, the focus has to be on the power of the message and the anointed message. I'm cool with all the other stuff. I am. I like, I like actually... We haven't done anything because we, we just, we, we were going to make some changes. It's kind of, we kind of got to the point of what are we going to do until we know what the business partner is going to do. Because if we don't, you know, we don't want to go putting money in doing something and then they come in and go, oh, we're not, you know, we're changing, you're out of here. And, we, and then we spent money for nothing. Right. So we're kind of, we're kind of been holding on to find out what they're going to do. There are going to be some, you're going, you're going to like the changes, I think. I can preach out in the middle of a field with a tent and a straw hay behind me so I can preach with cool stuff. Anyway. All that to say this, don't get so caught up with being cool. You know, everybody wants to be cool now. You know, listen, if, if Nathan's young, he's not going to dress like his daddy. Doesn't want to dress like his daddy, except he got the memo this morning. <laughs> so did Dick. The rest of you, well, bless your hearts. Nathan came up, Huh? Yeah, Nathan, you will get there. Nathan came walking and said, uh, well, how did this happen again? We had this thing called a shirt. We didn't see each other before we got downstairs. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, he's not going to dress like me. And I am not going to dress like him. <laughs> Them red shoes he had on last week, you're not going to see me in those. <laughs> not in a suit. You know, maybe, maybe at the beach or something, you know, and, and, you know but, but not in a suit. I kind of looked at him and went, I just ain't saying anything. That's what I did. He came down last week, and I thought, I ain't saying nothing. Just, it's not me. Yeah, that's all okay. <coughs> but we have, to, we have to stay with the anointing and stay with the word as our main focus and force. We can't take a path contrary to what, you know, you got, see so what happens is people start becoming so culturally, culturally relevant, they start leaving out the word. And they start being cool. We don't want to say anything that's going, to, that's going to offend people. Let me tell you something, honey. If you're not offending people with the gospel, you're not preaching the word. What do you mean offending? They're going to get upset when you, con when you challenge their lifestyle with the word. When they tell you you've got to live according to the word of God, they're not going to like that. Now, what it is is so they can be cut to heart and repent and come to Jesus. They've got to change, and they've got to know they've got to change. Amen. Amen. They've got to know what they're doing is wrong. You can't, you can't bring them in and say, okay, it's okay to just keep living like you're living. God don't care. Yes, he does. He took Jesus said, go tell him, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Repent does not mean God don't care, keep doing what you're doing. Amen. Repent means a change. Radical change. How are you going to have a radical change? The only way you can have a radical change is to come to Jesus Christ and be born again so you're radically different on the inside. Amen. Amen. So don't, don't think you can disobey God and it's going to work. It didn't work out real good. Amen? Philippians 2.12, Paul writes and says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We, you know. And then verse 2.29, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such a reputation. Talk about one of his ministers he sent to him. 1 Thessalonians 5, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. What is it with this new idea that you don't have to respect authority? Think about it now. Now, my father-in-law passed away, and not once in my life did I refer to him and speak to him and call him Calvin. 
Not one time in my life did I ever walk up to him and say, hey, Calvin, how you doing? I never walked up to Miss Glisson and said, Nellie, how you doing today? That's the new thing. Everybody calls their in-laws by their first name. That's a lack of respect. And it's been trained everywhere you can go. Everywhere down, everywhere you can go. Everybody, I saw a kid in, in, in their high school one time, came up to the fence. His dad was over. His dad's the principal. And he went, hey, Tim, Tim. I like to pass out. Now, I love my kids, but they come walking up and go, Eddie, something's going to fly. And if it's a two-by-four, if it's a dish pan, if it, if something's going to fly. We don't, we, we've been teaching people not to respect authority. Adults do it, oh, just call me Sue. You want to feel young. You're training them to disrespect authority. That went over big. That's just your opinion. No, the Bible teaches us to respect those with the rule over us. Oh, the preacher, he's just like you. You can just call him Ed. Now, now in my culture growing up in church, we always referred to the minister as brother or preacher. We didn't call him pastor so-and-so. We always, we always called him, you know, the, the minister was brother so-and-so. Or, or the older people in the church, we always called them brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Because that was just a, it was a sign of respect of, their, of just the fact they're elders in the church. Let the elders be counted worthy of honor, especially. Now listen, he didn't say don't count the other ones. He said let the elders be counted worthy of honor, especially those who labor in word and deed. Amen. Are you here? You're going home. And I'll do, I'll do that with older people that are older than me. You know, Mr. C, you know, Mr. C was with us. I never called him by his first name. What was his first name? Some of y'all didn't know he had a first name, did you? <laughs> his first name was Harda. But I, I never called it, not one time have I ever called it, even we've gone to see him since, he's, since they left the church, we've gone to see him, see how they're doing and stuff. It's I, Mr. C. Miss, I call Sister Geraldine, Sister Geraldine. I don't call her Geraldine. Are you here? There is something about respecting authority and maintaining that level of respect that keeps the door open for ministry to our lives or wisdom to our lives from them. But the minute you can get yourself on equal plane with them. Now, I'm our pastor back in, back in Greenville. Years ago, told me to stop calling him pastor. He said, we're contemporaries. We're, you know, we're equals. You're pastoring now. Yeah, I'm pastor. You know, you just call me John. I said, I can't do it, Pastor. Now, he's only a year older than me. I can't do it. Why? I still call Pastor John Sister Debbie. Why? Because there is a place of respect and honor that belongs there. And I believe we do a disservice to people when we teach them not to do that. Now, I understand where he was coming from. He's trying to say, look, we're ministers. We know we're equal, you know. Yeah, but, you know, it's not like I just met you and we're, we're contemporary ministers and we just, we're, you know, you've been my pastor. And God placed you in my life that way. So maybe a uh, guy down the street who's never under you as, 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 as pastor can call you John, and that's cool. I can't do it. Now, I might be able to call the guy down the street Jimmy. But my pastor, even though we're not there in that church anymore, there's still that level of respect. I don't call Pastor Hagen Ken. Now, there are people who do. They're, 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 they would have been lifelong buddies. Brother uh, Hankins, you know, and he might say publicly one thing, but in private, they, they, talk, they, they refer to each other in a different way. But I can't do it. So we have to learn that there are elements in life about respecting authority. Understand this. If you do not understand authority, this is, listen, obey those with the rule over you, submit to them, listen to those older you, Lord, so you can grow. Remember one of the key things that Jesus said about faith. Remember this? The centurion. He said, I have a servant at home who's sick. 
come and heal him. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He says, not, no. He said, now, actually, what was going on here, he was sent, they were sending servants back, a servant was going back and forth. He said, I'm not worthy. You should come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man. Listen to what that centurion said. I am a man set under authority. And I say to this one, go, and he goeth. And to this one, come, and he cometh. And to the other, do this, and he doeth it. So speak the word only, and my servant be healed. Jesus turned and went, I've not seen so great a faith all in all of Israel. Now, wait, what caused him to, what caused the centurion to have such a revelation of faith? He understood authority. As a matter of fact, he said, I am set under authority. He didn't say, I have authority. I'm set under it. In other words, I am under authority. And because I am under authority, I can exercise authority. When we teach people to respect authority, then we learn the principles of faith. Amen. And so we do one another harm when, when you know, you're trying to be cool and trying to be hip as a parent, as an in-law parent. I'll oh, just tell you, your new daughter-in-law, you're going to call me so-and-so. Now, I've told my kids, I don't care what they tell you to call them, you call them this. Why? Now, even Shannon, a, in the job she has as a teaching assistant, they, the, the, some of those guys say, look, just call me so-and-so. But when they're in the classroom, they have to refer to them as doctor or professor so-and-so. They can't call them Julie or Jenny or Joe or uh, what's, her, what's her face? Jimmy Bob. They can't refer to the professors as by their first name in the classroom. Why? Because it teaches those freshmen to disrespect the authority that person has. Even they, even they got it down. Are you here? You're gone home. I remember I went over to G-Tech the other day uh, during summer school, and one of the kids used to be at Westland. I mean, and I, and I started to say something, and I just walked off. He goes, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm thinking. I just looked at him, Christian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nathan knows him. And I'm, I, I kind of looked at him like, oh, so you're out of high school now, you just call me Ed. See, we, we, we train, we're training. Remember the 60s. What was the big thing of the 60s? Rebellion. What do they call the, the cops, the police, pigs, oinkers? We had a disrespect for authority. And look what's happened out of that generation. It's not my generation. I came in on the tail end of that generation. Thank God. I mean, by the time I graduated high school, Vietnam was over. But they call cops the pigs, the oinkers. They, they go out and protest in the streets. They wouldn't take baths, grow their hair long, have all this crazy sex. You know, everybody talks about how Woodstock was a day a nation came together or a week a nation came together. It didn't come together. You're talking about it was just a bunch of rebellious drug addicts all getting together, playing rock and roll. And everybody looks back at, at it fondly. Hey, and remember all the guys who hated the establishment and didn't like capitalism? Guess who all you Wall Street junkies are? That crowd. That same crowd is all the Wall Street guys. What am I saying? If we are going to be sensitive and, be, and discerning and, hear, and walk in the things of God, we're going to have to respect authority. You know, I was preaching earlier, and y'all were saying amen, at least some. But you got mighty quiet now. Why? We cannot work against the respect of authority. We have to walk in harmony with it. God has ordained the powers that be. Now, he, he may not ordain the actual person that's holding that position, but he's ordained the powers of it. Amen? That went over real good. 1 Thessalonians 12 and 13, we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. 
to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace. I'm telling you, you do away with a bunch of church splits that people would esteem very highly the man working among them. What do you think, Brother Benny? It's, it never ceases to amaze me that when somebody comes into contradiction in their beliefs or their attitude or something didn't go their way, that suddenly the man that they used to call the pastor, the man of God, the one that we're right behind you, yada, 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 they no longer esteem. And the minute you lose the esteem, you're in trouble. Because now you've been, you'll be called out by the devil. And you'll start thinking things, and you'll start, you know, thinking you've got a right to believe this, and a right to think this, and the right to say that, and the right to do this, all because you've lost your esteem. The Bible says to esteem them very highly for their work's sake. Amen. Somebody say, yeah, double amen. amen. See, people don't, want to, people don't want to preach this, you know. Uh, listen, if we, if, we could, if we started esteeming all of our pastors very highly, now, number one, it made their job a whole lot easier. Instead, they had to run around and put out fires in the church and make sure this one's not upset, make sure this one's happy, and make sure this one hadn't gotten disgruntled, and make sure this one that. We could be about getting everybody going out there and getting in the lost in. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Can I get at least 20%? Amen. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. What? Your lack of esteeming them very highly hinders their ability to work the way they need to work. And then your words become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Hello? You can call defeat in on another person, especially like in the church setting. Why don't we call victory in? I said, why don't we call victory in? Amen? I mean, well, Pastor Ed's got it going on. Pastor Ed's anointed. Pastor Ed's speaking to my life. Pastor Ed's speaking to other people's lives. Pastor Ed's anointed by the Holy Ghost. He's got the word for the day. I'm telling you, when we go to church, every time we go to church, Pastor Ed's, you know, and I'm telling you, when you stop that and you lose that esteem, it stops working that way for you. Amen. Then next thing you're telling other people, well, you know, I used to get fed here, but I just don't get fed anymore. On, now you're going to sow, now you're gonna, not only are you going to stop esteeming them yourself, you're going to sow the seed of discontent in another person. Who do you think's at work there? It's not Jesus. It's not the head of the church who called the pastor and set him there that's trying to sow the seed of discontent. Who do you think it is? Thank you. We have to understand. We're to love, listen, our church, if you're listening to me and you're in another church, your pastor, your church, you need to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Can you say amen? amen? And so you can be at peace among yourselves. I can tell you the people we've never been able to satisfy or keep happy are the ones who won't respect us. Hello? Go around the church and tell everybody, well, you know, Ed and Janie. This, Ed and Janie that. They've lost their respect for the authority. In the church, they go, and, 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 and somebody else, you know, they leave here and they go to another church, or they came from another church, or came here, you know, and they did that where they came from, and where they go. What's happening? See, that's, that, that's just sowing a seed of disrespect for authority among the congregation. We can't afford that in the kingdom. There's something to do that's bigger than your little pet peeve. Then you're a little, I want this. There's things bigger. There are souls going to hell. I know one church, that somebody in the church wanted to build a walkway from the sanctuary to another part of the, uh, the church campus that had standalone buildings so the children could be safe, and it was going to cost a million dollars. And they thought it would be a great faith project. Who told you to get, you're not the visionary. You're going to come up and tell the church they need to build a million-dollar high-rise over the parking lot walkway so the children will be safe. Get you a couple of umbrellas and some stop signs and some fluorescent vests and walk out there and do like the schools do. Stop. In the name of... Anyway, anyway. 
I mean, better yet, just put up, you know, some temporary, you know, go out there when it's time for them to walk over and put little barriers out there and let them walk over. Now they're mad and causing trouble in the church because they didn't get their way. They didn't get their little million-dollar project. Now, before that, the pastor was cool. The pastor was great. The pastor heard from heaven. The pastor spoke the truth. It's pastor this, pastor that. Blah, blah, blah. Now they didn't get their way. Right, we, you know, we're, you know, we're going to start a church. You're not walking because of the way. Yeah, you're going to get a walkway. You, well, let me see you build your walkway. Come on now. What? When you don't esteem those over you, when you don't esteem those ministers in your life very highly in love for their work's sake, you'll lose peace among yourselves. And see, there has to be peace in the church. Sheep get startled easy. Why is it when churches split that you lose people who aren't even involved in it? Because they're sheep and they get startled. Come on now. They get, they get startled. And they run. Hello. And, they, and they're just caught up in something they don't even understand just because they got startled. And that's not what God wants happening in his churches. He doesn't want stuff, people, the sheep getting startled. He wants peace among us. So what do we do? Those who are older in the Lord need to be what? Esteemed. And those who are mature in the, in the saints need to demonstrate esteeming them very highly in love for their work's sake. <laughs> I've been told that I walk out to the, to the, to the netherworld out there. Is that better? Hallelujah. I was trying to get over here, Brother Benny. Get, get some spiritual support from Brother Benny over there. And he's sitting there in the dark. See, Brother Benny says, I'm the light. He doesn't need to. He, hey, I, <laughs> <laughs> Know then the labor among you and are over you in the Lord. One of the things I've always noticed is when people get mad with me. Now, I'm just going to speak from personal experience. When they get mad with me, they think they can say things and do things that the Bible does not say they can say and do. And it's not because I'm living in sin. It's not because I'm running around with women in the church. It's not because we're, you know, we're, we're doing this, we're doing that. It's not because we're, on the, we're home on the Internet looking at pornography because I don't. My wife, my wife would kill me. Besides, she checks the, checks the computers. Anyway. And at our church, we put up, we, we had at least it went, it had a thing that blocked all this stuff so you couldn't get to it because we didn't want people coming to church to get on a computer and going, you know, we would not know who it was and then say I was doing it. So we just have to block it. Because you just can't afford the, the, the just somebody has, to, oh, somebody has to do it and then somebody say, oh, somebody at that church was doing this. I bet it was a pastor. Then you got a problem. It's not, it's never for sin. I never had anybody come to me and say, I know that you're running around. I'm leaving the church. You would not believe some of the things, reason people live. And sometimes they'll just lie and make up stuff. Say, I didn't do something that I did do. I'm talking about I didn't take care of them, didn't look over them, didn't whatever. You didn't do such and such. Yes, I know you didn't. People get mad at me because I preach the truth. You got one guy who left the church, a guy who took, took his girlfriend out and got the, whoever else they were kind of hooked up with because I told them they shouldn't be living together. Yeah. And then one around told everybody in the church, I'm just this and I'm that. Well, Barry, the girl, stop living with her. Amen. Do right. If we would do the Bible, now in Faith and Victory Church, but I'm telling you in all churches, if we would do the Bible, where Paul says, I beseech you, he said, that's begging. Brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. This is where that lack of respect for authorities come in. See, we think we can just do whatever we want to do, and the, the pastor is only over us as long as we want him to be over us. There's a relationship there that goes beyond your desires. Amen. I've had people tell me, God led them to this church. God called me to this church. This is my church. God sent me here. And get mad and leave. Now, which is it? I said, which is it? Did God call you, or did you, or, and, and now that you got mad, that, that, that changes the call because you're mad about something. See, if we'll maintain the proper position, <laughs> my, my thing just disappeared. Come back. 
Notes come back. Hallelujah. If we'll maintain the proper position and esteem them. How did he say esteem them? Very how? Very highly. very highly. Why? In love. Wow. God demands that you esteem those over you very highly in love. What? For their work's sake. Your lack of, es of esteeming them properly, a lack of loving them properly, hinders the work they're called to do for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to stand, I would not want to stand before the Lord and have to deal with that one. Oh, you're trying to manipulate me. No, I'm just reading the Bible to you. It's not a free-for-all, folks. This is not a smorgasbord. Pick whatever you want to do and do whatever you want to do. And I don't have to obey them, and I don't have to submit, and I don't have to obey, and I don't have to do this. Why? Because I'm a Christian. I can do whatever I want to do. Hogwash! You are a part of the body of Jesus Christ, and God has sent you into a local church, and he's put over you a pastor, a shepherd. And like I said, in all of our years of ministry, we've never been accused of sin. It's always been. You didn't get something you wanted. And somehow or another, it was my fault. I think I'll give you the biggest one that years, a few years ago, a number of years ago. Had somebody in the church. They were on the worship team. And the, and the wife and the mother-in-law said, we got to talk to you. I said, okay. So we met. And at that time, my office was in, so we met over here. Said, my husband has been going out. Well, the mother-in-law said, my son-in-law has been going out with my son, sitting out at some lake at a construction site somewhere, sitting in lounge chairs naked, drinking wine coolers, and my son-in-law been getting my son about half lit, and then they've been uh, engaging in some homosexual fondling. Really? Now, when you're the pastor, you have, it's kind of hard to keep that dumbfounded look off your face, but you got to try real hard. Because you're, 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 you're one to go. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? But, you know, they're, they're trying, they're, you're trying to be there to help them deal with what's going on because it's a mess. And they're gonna, but you can't tell them we told you anything. Now, let me say this. I no longer accept that disclaimer. If you come to me and I need to deal with it, I'm going to deal with it. You don't get the opt out to tell me and I got to sit around and walk around with it and I can't do anything about it. That, those days are over. I've learned. So then they told me that they were drinking and smoking and uh, all this kind of stuff. And um, I could deal with that. Okay, all right. So I had to get them off the platform. It had to be dealt with. Now, sat him down, said, we understand, you know, what's going on? They began to confess a little bit. They never confessed about the other stuff. They did tell us, yeah, I've been drinking, I've been smoking. Okay, listen, you know the rules for being on the platform, you can't do that. Okay. And if you, now listen, here's what we did. You can step down for a season. Our goal is to restore you. You're going to come off for a season. Until I say it's right, you're going to come off, you're going to sit in the services, you're going to come every service, we're going to minister to you, you're going to let the word of God work in you. See, our goal, and this is really what, our goal was to restore them. But they, can't, you, they couldn't keep doing that. And knowing all the stuff they were doing, we can't keep doing that. You're going to have to sit over here and get restored. Some of the things you could have done with them up here. But, but, but getting over to the sexual sins, there's some, there's some things about sexual sins that, that, that brings a, a, a spirit. Actually, homosexuality has an unclean spirit. It'll mess up the anointing. There's some personal things you could be dealing with, you know. But, but I'm telling you, you, get into this, you start getting into homosexual sins and sexual sins, there's spiritual things you get attached to that beyond, you know, uh, I smoke tobacco. All right? So we sat them down. And honestly, told them, we, we want to help restore you. We want to help you get free. We want to help you grow in the Lord. We want to get, you know, and we, when it's time, we'll get you back up there. They didn't want two months, they left the church. Then the mother uh, in law and the daughter. Started going around telling everybody, all I wanted to do was get him off the platform. You came to me. He didn't love us. He just wanted to get him off the platform. You came to me. You're the one upset that your son-in-law is feeling up your son. 
and rightfully so. You're the one who wants something done about it. And now that I did something about it, I, didn't, I don't love them. See, that's the kind of stuff we've dealt with. Not sin on our part. Some fabricated garbage. Hello. And you think your job is tough. <laughs> Sit across my desk a couple of days. Now, I'm anointed to do it. But, you know, it's tough when you go out there and you do what's right, and then people accuse you of doing what, what, of what you did was right and making it something that it wasn't. I had this happen in my life. You didn't care about me. Hogwash. I did this, 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 and this for you. No, you didn't. This conversation's over. Not sin. If we esteem the leaders very highly in love, we would never get to that point. And we understood that our esteeming them in love for their work's sake was essential to them being able to carry out the plan of God. We wouldn't get to that place. Our churches would be healthier. And we're going, to, we're going to stand in a healthy place here. Amen. Because you're going to esteem those over you in the Lord very highly in love for their work's sake. What's that mean? Just like Dave, you're going to have to put a guard over your mouth that you might sin, not sin against the Lord. You're going to watch what you say. And more than that, you're going to watch who you say it to. Somebody that left the church, I told him, I said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. And they got furious with me. Who do you think you are telling me that I need to? I tell you if, you, if you, if you go to anybody in church and tell them anything, I'm going to deal with it. Who do you, it's beyond contempt that you think you have to tell me not to go to people in the church. You've already told me you're going to start calling people in the church. So I'm telling you, how you what you're going to say. And you're not going to say anything else. You got, you know, got mad with me? Well, I'm sorry. The church is not a place that you can go around and make yourself look good when you're not esteeming me very highly in love for the work's sake. How do you know? I could, well, I, there's other things that happen. I could tell you, prove they won't walk in love toward me. I can pull it out and show it to you, but I'm not going to. That's not beneficial to you, and I ain't going to tell you who it is. It's been, you know, there's been some time. We got, we got enough people left the church, you can never figure out who, who I'm talking about. Because there's been so many. You could probably figure out who I was talking about if you were still here. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> we have to learn. Oh, are you trying to get somebody to left the church? No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach you that if, if, we're gonna, if, if our church or any church watching us is going to be stable, it is not the pastor that can make it stable by himself. Because if you don't esteem him very highly in love for his work's sake, it can't be stable. Because he goes on and says, what is, remember what he said right there? There would be peace among us. Isn't that what it said? Amen. And be at peace among yourselves. I'm telling you, when we get to a point where we're esteeming the leadership very highly for love's sake, for the work that they're doing, they will create a peace in the, in the congregation. And skittish sheep will settle down. It's amazing that when there's stability, how those that are a little skittish can settle down and hook back in. Amen. It's our job to make sure that happens. So that when people walk in, if they come in and visit, they don't come in to, and sense that there's sense peace. And, the, you know, and they may have all kinds of things like that they need our ministry to minister to, that we're called to minister to. We're not the only church in Greece, but I'm telling you, we're called. And we're anointed. And we got the goods, and we got the, we got the anointing to minister to people in, in different, various ways. Our calling is different than other churches' callings. My ministry is different than somebody else's ministry. My style is different. We'll be talking about that laugh later. It was a good laugh. Yeah! 
Went to a ball game last night. <laughs> We're called. And there are people who need to be here because they'll receive from the way we minister. There's going to be somebody who will never receive from the way I preach. They just won't. They don't, they don't like me. There's people who don't like me. You know I know you can't believe it. There are people who don't like me. Really? Janice knows them. <laughs> and they're not going to receive. But you know, there's people, there's other people past me in the city that some people don't like that can receive from us that won't receive from them. We have to fulfill our part, and we have to do our part in the church. Stop measuring success by how big somebody is or, how, or lack of it by how small somebody is. Let's do our job. Let's esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake so there's peace among us. Let's get our job done so we can win the loss and grow the kingdom, not just our local church, but grow the kingdom and do, take care of our part. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for uh, the fact that we're going to get done with this series eventually. And we thank you that people are learning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, I trust you to um, take what we said this morning in the way that was intended. God wants us to learn to respect authority and to walk in that place and to grow and to be, uh, be strong as a congregation. There are gifts. Your pastor has been gifted and deposits of the anointing have been placed in him. That's me. By the Holy Ghost, humanity needs to come in contact with. Meaning we have to grow us so we can get to them, minister to them. Impartations by the Spirit. Gifts by the Spirit. Sometimes we go overseas and minister overseas. They're tapped into stronger because we're, we're with people that, that have never encountered them. Well, if we get more people, new people in here, there'll be more manifestation here because they'll have never encountered them. And they need to flow because people need to come in contact with it. We have strong anointings and deposits from the Spirit. There are things there I know are there, but I don't, you know, that, that I haven't even ever tapped into because we just haven't got to, we need to get to a certain place for them to be able to flow. Hallelujah. Remember Brother Summer laying hands on me the, a year before he passed away, he went home, he, he was, we were at the threshold conference, and one of the things Brother Summer was doing, he was getting to many young ministers as he get to, he wanted to lay hands on them and impart something to them out of the spirit because he wanted to get that in as many people as he could before he left. He knew he was leaving. He'd already planned to go. He's laying hands on as many people as he could get to. I've had some really anointed men make deposits by the Spirit. Well, I don't believe in all that. Well, Paul said, remember, but stir up the gift that's within. He's talking to Timothy. That is within thee by the putting on the hands of the presbytery. Yeah. See, there are things imparted by the Spirit. Yeah. All right, Brother Benny? That God makes deposits in men, and then they can make deposits in others. And there are people in Greensboro, and Winston-Salem, and High Point, and Jamestown, in the local area, that need to come in contact with these deposits because they, they need a withdrawal made out of that into their life. And people are getting upset because the pastor didn't visit them on the third Sunday they missed. And there are people going to go to hell. People are going to die from cancer. People are going to die from different diseases because you're not coming and keeping peace in the house because you're upset because I didn't come by and visit you and you've been serving the Lord 20 years. Say, so, ouch. And if you're home watching, ouch, ouch. There are people who have great needs. And you, we need to get back to esteeming them very highly in love for their, for their work's sake. Not because it makes them feel better psychologically. There's a work to be done. I said there's a work to be done. And there is a work that must be accomplished. And people are hurting. In the, oh, Barbusto tre frecamete silly, but let the bus recommend a bete. 
Eller med av då sura bädningarna när man är i bädning. Låt oss någon redan inte ta sura. Bara det är säkert och den är. Alla må då fräcker sig att dåliga man är så säkert att det är läkigt. And the gifts and deposits and callings of God have been made in days past. Things that I have made in preparation since the foundation of the world, says the Lord. These things have I reserved unto these times, that they may be released and imparted and shared and administered to the lost and to the hurting and to the disease and the afflicted, that they may know the goodness of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord and the graciousness of the Lord. So recognize the value of the gift set before you. Recognize that within the gift is deposits many. Deposits of the Lord to carry out my will and purpose and to minister to hurting humanity. Set aside, as my word declares, the weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. And run with patience the race that has been set before you and see the goodness and the mercy in the hand of the Lord demonstrated and manifest. And let the joy of ministry to others be greater than the joy of ministry to yourself. And great shall be your reward, and great shall be the blessing, and great shall be the joy in your life because of it, says the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.